Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Angelic Conflict class. This is the 4th of November, 2021. I want to welcome all of you who are joining us for the first time and those of you who have been with us for some time. We are going to be studying a, an important part of the Angelic Conflict as it actually revolves around something which borders on being a superstition. As a result, it then militates against the truth of the gospel. Let me repeat that. The truth of the gospel. So having said that, let me uh, welcome you once again. And uh, whenever we uh, go through one of these particular studies, we always take a few moments for silent prayer. The study of silent or the Moment of Silent Prayer is dedicated so that we can align ourselves with the justice of God and that in that way we can receive the teaching that the Holy Spirit has for us. I'm not a policeman. I do not uh, check in to see whether your sins are confessed or not. That is strictly your business. You are the one that must decide whether your sins are confessed or not. And if they're not, you are the one who is responsible for not confessing them. Okay, having said that, let's take a few moments for silent prayer, and I will close with audible prayer. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you have given to us a few moments to be able to center our minds on the teaching of the Word of God. We pray for each individual who is uh, tuning in and who is listening to this particular uh, session, whether it is now live as we are streaming or whether it is later as a recording. We ask that the Holy Spirit would convict the hearts, the minds, the souls of the believer so that the believer would take these things to heart. We pray, Father, that we might make the matter absolutely clear, and the matter is the matter of the gospel. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Whenever we begin our teaching sessions, we always like to go to a certain passage of Scripture in order to initiate our teaching. And so if you would kindly turn in your Bibles to, Galatia, or to Genesis, chapter 3 verses 14 and 15. If you have turned there, this is what this passage says. This is what this passage says. The Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you more than all cattle, and more than every beast of the field. On your belly you will go, and dust you will eat all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. This not only gives us the first public announcement of the gospel, and the gospel is this. And that is that there is going to be enmity between the seed of the woman, which is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the serpent. And that the serpent is going to lose the battle. Okay, let's uh, continue then with our teaching. We have noted that we, as we are studying the doctrine of idolatry, that we have come to a passage of Scripture. The first 14 verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and then the last eight or so verses of the same chapter. The, this particular chapter teaches us about idolatry, and it teaches us about our association with certain idolatrous um, associations. These idolatrous associations are very closely linked together with demonism, and we need to understand it. Verse 15 is the pivotal point of the chapter. I call it the point of the spear. 
because this is where the decision must be made by you, the individual, as to how you're going to apply this word of God. In verse 16, we have, well, beginning at verse 16 and going on, uh, we have three questions that actually uh, bring about the applications for the church age believer. And these applications are in the form of a question. In uh, verse 16, we have the question, is not the cup of blessing which we bless? And that, of course, is what we call the Lord's table or communion table. And so there is, a, there is this particular conflict which exists between the table of demons or the Satan's table and the table of the Lord. Which one is it that you are going to uh, espouse? Now the scripture tells us in verse, in verse 17, that there is but one bread and that we therefore are one because we partake of the one bread. And then in verse 18, we are told that our association with this table is very much like the association of the priest and the other people of the Old Testament. What this tells us is that our union is with Christ, whether we recognize it or we don't recognize it. What happens then is that our conduct, whether or not we are involved in the, in the worship of idols, uh, then, shall I say, it disturbs, it um, causes a detour from our fellowship with the Lord. The next question that we have is, uh, is is the thing sacrificed to idols anything? Is an idol anything? And the answer to this is no. But to join in the sacrifice is to become an endorser of demons. And so if you wish to endorse demons, this is what you would do. Another answer is that as an apostle, he does not want you to endorse demons. In other words, as an apostle, as the highest authority on earth regarding the church, he says, do not endorse demons. So it becomes a question of obedience for you. Will you do it or will you not do it? And then the next uh, answer is, you cannot eat, you cannot drink of the table of the Lord and the table of demons. These three answers to the question make it quite clear that you as a believer have no part in idol worship or in the worship of demons. Now we come to the third question. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? And of course the answer to this is no. So in answering this question, there are several points that we need to take into consideration. The first one is the background of this question. Are we stronger than he? Do we provoke him to jealousy? And the background is that this is the second commandment of the Ten Commandments. And so that requires a fair amount of exploration for us to be able to answer this. Now, the people in Paul's time uh, also needed to explore this to the same extent that we do, but they had a much clearer conception of Jewish life and Jewish beliefs than you and I do. And so as a result, Paul only had to mention some things and they would already be understood. Now remember that the Apostle Paul didn't just teach once. He taught many times to these Corinthians and it is now that he is writing that he is reducing his teachings to writing. So the first point of the background of this is Exodus 20 and verse 5. The next uh, area of background is Deuteronomy 32, 21, cross-referencing it to Romans 10, 19. So let's take a look at the background of Exodus 20 and verse 5. 
the background gives us four various uh, clauses or four commands which are involved in the second commandment. And the first one is do not make an idol. The second one is do not make any likeness. The third one is do not worship either the idol or the likeness. And then the fourth one is do not serve them. Well, we understand what it means not to make an idol, not to make a likeness, not to worship them. But what about serving them? What and how does that command fit in? Well, let me uh, expand on this, and I have started to expand on this for the last couple of weeks. First of all, the serving of these idols or these demons uh, becomes a question when it comes to things like Chinese New Year's. You may say to me, you know, Pastor, I love going to San Francisco. Uh, I love going to Seattle and to watch the Chinese New Year's celebration, to see the vibrant colors, the dances, the uh, dramatic music that is played, the firecraft. All of that is very interesting. And if you are there only for a cultural point, then that is okay. The second uh, item that I brought to your attention is the Feast of Holi in India and in Nepal. And um, once again, uh, if you are there to observe and to become acquainted with that particular cultural activity, that's okay. Uida, the voodoo festival. And um, many of you are, are already aware that uh, voodoo is actually a religion which is recognized. It has some very strange uh, uh, customs, and uh, among them is the sacrifice of animals. And um, the sacrifice of the animals is feared, and those that have been very closely tied with voodoo will tell you that the sacrifice of animals is just the first step which eventuates in the sacrifice of human beings. So that when you sacrifice an animal, you are expecting that you are going to receive some blessing in your business or in your farm, in your romance life or something. If that isn't working, then there needs to be something done with the blood of the sacrificial animal. And if that doesn't avail, then you move up the scale and uh, maybe there is some human blood that you must drink, some human blood that you must pour on yourself or um, uh, sprinkle on your body. And if that doesn't avail, then of course, human sacrifice is there. Now, if you are an adherent to voodoo, you're gonna say, you are dead wrong, this is not right. You are overreaching. And so all that I'm going to tell you on that account is study it out and see what conclusion you come to. After that, we then looked at the festival of Mardi Gras. And we saw how this is a lot closer to home because this is a festival that is celebrated by the Roman Catholic Church. And Mardi Gras is the French for Fat Tuesday. In other words, this is the last fling that you have before Lent. Lent will last approximately 40 days, and that uh, is when you try to be as holy as you possibly can to please God as much as you can. But you stop on Mardi Gras, and on Ash Wednesday, you begin your Lenten season. Similar to that particular uh, cultural uh, celebration is the celebration of Christmas and the Christmas tree. And there are many Christians who have made a taboo out of the Christmas tree. And I have shown you the passages of scripture that talk about 
quote-unquote a Christmas tree. You will note that the Bible never says anything about a Christmas tree. It talks about a green tree. And uh, Christians, uh, particularly in the United States, have taken that to mean an evergreen tree, like a spruce uh, or a dug fir or something along those lines. Uh, I have shown you from Scripture that the 14 or so passages of Scripture that refer to a green tree do not refer to a Christmas tree or something like that. These particular proponents or opponents of Christmas trees will also say that when you get down to open your presents, you are bowing down at the foot of an idol, which is the Christmas tree. And uh, there could be nothing further from the truth. You cannot spiritualize something and make it count. If you start doing that, you will be like the Jehovah's Witness and uh, you will not be able to uh, interpret the Bible with any reliability because of the fact that you are taking a fact and ascribing a different meaning to it than what the scripture meant to ascribe to it. So today we are coming to the last of these sections which deal with serving and that would be serving these idols or these likenesses or these superstitions. What does it mean to serve? And that item that we are going to study today is that of circumcision. Circumcision is that item that we will look at today. Circumcision has been observed by the people of Israel from the time of Abraham. And so uh, I want to read to you a, an excerpt from the Jerusalem Post. And this is what it says. <clears throat> In part of the interview, the Midrash relates that Turnus Rufus, the Roman governor of Palestine, asked the great sage, the Rabbi Akiva, quote, if God wanted man to be circumcised, why didn't he create man in that way that is already circumcised? Rabbi Akiva then responded, quote, because God gave the commandments to the Jewish people to purify them. Now, please take a look at this answer because it is completely false. God has created an incomplete world, and man has been assigned to help complete the task. Well, that is false information. The Bible gives us more correct information, and um, we are going to at least get a glimmer of that today. Circumcision. And on your screen, you should see a figure of a traffic officer. And if you have ever been stopped for speeding, for running a stop sign or a stoplight, uh, if you live in the Pacific Northwest, you know that there are cameras on the red lights. And if you happen to run a red light, your video will be taken and uh, you will be charged in court and the fine is a hefty 150 or so dollars. So in order for you to save a 30 second or 45 second period of time, because that's how long it takes for a, a traffic light cycle, then uh, you are paying through the nose for that. When an officer pulls you over, he usually asks you for a number of things. And I want you to think as to what that might be. And so let's commence with our study here of circumcision. First of all, circumcision was a sign of being in covenant with God. Being in covenant means that you have entered into a pact, into a treaty with God. Number two, being circumcised could mean being saved. 
Let me repeat. Being circumcised could mean being saved, but it does not necessarily aver salvation. In other words, just because you're circumcised does not mean that you are saved. Well, I asked you to think, what would that officer say to you? Well, the answer is that he's going to ask you for your license, your registration, and for your proof of liability insurance. You will then reach into your glove compartment and you will fumble through whatever you have in there uh, to find your registration. That is the uh, document that shows that you have legal license plates. And you will also look for the, your proof of insurance coverage. Your license you should have in your wallet and uh, you will look uh, for that. In uh, today's society, because uh, there is so much crime that is rampant and because the police are not able to investigate every car theft, more and more people are taking a picture of their license, picture of their registration, and a picture of their uh, insurance uh, coverage and they are keeping them in their phone so that when the policeman pulls you over and he asks you for these things even though the law says that you must produce the paper they are now accepting what is now on your phone if they don't you will go to court and you will show the judge and the judge will say case dismissed they will send a small reprimand to the officer because he is being punctilious. He is demanding something that actually puts you at risk because the thieves, the car thieves, will look at your registration, find out what your address is, will take the garage door opener from your visor, go to your house, click it open, and steal you blind. Or they will uh, click open your GPS, find out where home is. They'll go to your house and uh, they will go in there. And so as a result, courts in the state of Washington are accepting a photo facsimile of your license, your registration, and your proof of insurance coverage. So, imagine what it would be like if you show up to church one day and there is a greeter or an usher. He says, you can't come in here unless you're circumcised. In other words, I need to see your license, your registration, and your proof that you're a Christian. Uh, in uh, vulgar parlance, we call this the short arm inspectors. You would be incensed that somebody would ask you to drop your pants so that they could see your junk to see whether you would be a Christian or not. And that is the issue with circumcision as it is related to us in Galatians and in Romans. Having your license, your registration, and your insurance does not mean that you're not going to get a ticket. All that it means is that you won't get a ticket because you have these required documents. But you might, and in fact, most likely, you will get a ticket for the traffic infraction. You ran a red light, you were speeding, uh, you got into the crosswalk while there was a pedestrian, any number of things. In the same way, being circumcised will not get you into heaven. Let me repeat, in the same way, just because you have circumcision, just like you would have your license, registration, etc., being circumcised will not get you into heaven. It may just mean that your ethnic background is Jewish. Or it might just mean that your parents wanted to keep you uh, in a 
very sanitary condition. Two passages of scripture we are going to study, Galatians 2 and Romans 4. But to begin with, let's uh, look at something else. What is the definition of the issue? What is the definition and the issue of circumcision? Number one, circumcision consists in the cutting away of the foreskin of the male phallus. Number two, a flint knife was used for the operation, Exodus 4.25 and Joshua 5.2. That is not the case in modern days. Another kind of knife is used. Uh, the sharper, the better, so as not to inflict uh, unintentional and um, damage which goes over the top. Number three. This ritual was related to Abraham's acknowledgement that a successful spiritual life is by grace and not human effort. Let me repeat point number three. This ritual, the ritual of circumcision, was related to Abraham's acknowledgement that a successful spiritual life, and now you want a successful spiritual life, don't you? That spiritual life is by grace and not by human effort. In Abraham's case, the blessing was sexual prosperity. Remember, Abraham was 99 years old when he had his first biological child. In his case, circumcision represented his adjustment to the justice of God. In other words, he not only accepted salvation through grace, but he accepted spiritual life or success in the spiritual life by grace. This is acceptance of the covenant. The covenant is unconditional. Let me repeat, the covenant is unconditional. That means grace. That means that the human being does not have to do anything. It is unconditional. It is grace. Number four. At the beginning of the church age, there were those who preached that before a person could become a Christian, he had to be circumcised. That is, he had to become a Jew. All right, let's see if I can paint the picture for you. It's the beginning of the church age. The first churches, or the first church in the beginning was almost entirely, if not 100%, Jewish. There was no question or issue as to circumcision. But then, <coughs> excuse me. <laughs> but then, Gentiles were brought into the fold. The first report was by Peter, who gave the gospel to some Gentiles and they believed in Christ. They received the Holy Spirit, which is the identifying mark of the church age believer. And these people were Gentiles. Therefore, they were not circumcised. And so some of the old timers, some of the old faithful guard said, how can they possibly be Christians if they haven't been circumcised? They have to do the same things that we did. This concept was similar to the pagan superstition that eating meat sacrificed to idols would somehow benefit you spiritually and physically. In other words, the pagans back in Paul's time thought that if they ate some chunk of meat that was offered to an idol at one time or another, that that meat was holy that that meat was endowed with some supernatural power that is somehow going to benefit you in, before God. It is somehow going to bless you and, or it is somehow going to cause you to avoid suffering, sacrifice, and loss. So this concept of circumcision 
was along the same lines. This concept, that is the concept of having to be circumcised to be a Christian, is not just at variance with the gospel. It is completely contradictory to the gospel in that it requires that the would-be Christian perform a work. That work would be circumcision. So this is the definition of circumcision. It is the cutting off of the foreskin. And the issue is, do, do you have to be circumcised to get eternal life? Okay, before we get into Galatians chapter 2, I'm going to show you a timeline. And in this timeline, I want to illustrate to you how Galatians chapter 2 fits into this interpretation. Let's begin with the timeline. It's that blue line that goes across your screen. And um, in Galatians 2 and verse 1, if you would, you can open your Bibles to that passage if you want. But if not, it's just this little phrase, after a period or an interval of 14 years. And so let's see what that is. Well, in the life of the Apostle Paul, before he became a Christian, we are going to call him Saul. And so that is the first square that you find on our timeline. He was called Saul. He was on his way to Damascus to imprison Christians, to round them up and arrest them. And uh, our best guess, or our educated guess, is that this happened in the year 36 AD. Okay, so let's see if we can put our minds together. If the Lord was put on the cross in 30 AD, so this would be six years after. If he was put on the cross at 33 uh, AD, then this would be three years after. Since time uh, and the marking of time is so fluid in that ancient period of time, all that we can do is just work the math with the figures that we have. And we don't need to know the exact time. And it would be nice to know the exact time, but it is not necessary for the uh, interpretation of Scripture. And what is more, it is window dressing to the teaching of Scripture because it adds nothing to it. And so you may spend a lot of time in trying to dig out the chronology, but it will add nothing. Okay, let's go to our next point. In verse 36, the or in verse in year 36, the apostle Paul was on his way to Damascus to imprison some Christians when uh, he was knocked off of his horse by a bright shining light, and it was the Lord Jesus Christ. He was struck with blindness, and he was instructed to go to the city of Damascus, where he spent roughly a year under the, shall we say, the care of Ananias in the city of Damascus. So that is years 36 and 37, approximately just really one year. In the year 38, the Apostle Paul leaves Damascus and he goes to Jerusalem for something. And then he goes to the city of Tarsus. And Tarsus is where he grew up. It is his hometown. And this is where he uh, spent his early years as a Christian. Really, um, the church in Jerusalem didn't trust him. Uh, they didn't think that uh, he was telling the truth. And so he wasn't really welcome. So he went to his hometown of Tarsus, the year 38. Two years later, he went to Jerusalem and he met with Peter. Two years later, the year 40, he met with Peter 
And uh, this event we find in the first chapter of Galatians, verses 18 through 20. Five years later, he goes to Jerusalem accompanied by Barnabas, and they are taking some money from the church at Antioch to Jerusalem to give some relief to the people who were famished uh, through various things. But some of that was the persecution that came because uh, Christians were being really run out of town in Jerusalem. And the Apostle Paul, who was uh, just, as you could see, he was only 10 years old in the Lord, um, he went to Jerusalem accompanied with Barnabas, who at that time, believe it or not, Barnabas was of greater statue, stature than Paul. Five years after that, the year 50, the Apostle Paul goes to Jerusalem for a council meeting called the Jerusalem Council. Now, please take note of the fact that we are now in Acts chapter 15, and I'll point this out here. In Acts chapter 13, you have the first missionary journey and so this is after he has come back from the first missionary journey he goes to jerusalem and they treat the issue of what does a person need to do to get saved that takes place in the year 50. okay now remember that galatians 2 1 says after a period of time of 14 years after an interval of 14 years and so what does that mean well we know that the book of Galatians was written in the year 55 that would be five years after Acts 15 so if you subtract 14 years from 55 where do you come you come to this period of time right in here, the year 40, 41. Um, and so this is the period of time that the Apostle Paul is referring to the first time. And then he's going to refer to the other time that he was in Jerusalem, which would be year 50. So that is where we begin. Would you please turn in your Bibles now? to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Verse 1. Then, after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas taking Titus along also. Please take note that he says that this is now the second time, or at least a subsequent time, from the time that he got saved to go to Jerusalem. If you look at our diagram, you see how this actually fits in. It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. In verse 2, please note that the Apostle Paul is rendering himself to those who are the leadership in the Church of Jerusalem to see whether or not he had been giving the right gospel or not. So it says, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preach among the Gentiles. But I did so in private to those who were of reputation for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. 
Look at verse 3, please. In verse 3, we are uh, corroborating the evidence of verse 1, and that is that on this trip, he took Titus with him. And that the object of being in Jerusalem was to receive approval of his gospel messaging. And I suppose that we can say that the first article of evidence was Titus, a Greek, that is, a non-Jew, and he was not circumcised. And the Apostle Paul says, take a look at one of my converts. His name is Titus. And now look at verse 3. It says, he was not compelled to be circumcised. But even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was not compelled to be circumcised. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us in bondage. But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. Now please take into consideration that, <clears throat> that the Apostle Paul is writing to Galatian believers. These are generally not Jews. The congregation is made up of a mixture of Gentile and Jew, but primarily it is Jewish. They are in the land of, but it was primarily Gentile. They were, it was a congregation that was surrounded by Gentile people. And so he says, the Apostle Paul says in verse 5, that even though these false brethren came in and they contested the fact of the need for circumcision, the Apostle Paul says, we did not yield to them for even an hour. In other words, they wanted to explain their position. They wanted to give some rationale. And the Apostle Paul said, no, no, no. We're not going to listen to that uh, hogwash. Why? So that the truth of the gospel, please notice this phrase and underline it in your Bible. The truth of the gospel would remain with you. But from those who were of high reputation, what they were makes no difference to me. God shows no partiality. Well, those who were of reputation contributed nothing to me. In other words, I told them the gospel that I was preaching. I presented to them the ministry that I was holding. And you know what? They didn't say, you need to do this. You need to do that. They didn't say, what you're doing is just fine, Paul, but you need to do this. You need to do that. You need to add A. You need to add B. You need to add circumcision. They did not add anything. See, verse 6, they contributed nothing to me. But on the contrary, verse 7, but on the contrary, seeing that I had been entrusted with the gospel to the uncircumcised in the same way that Peter had been to the circumcised, now comes the parentheses, for he who effectually worked in Peter in his apostleship to the circumcised effectively or effectually work for me also to the Gentiles. Verse 8 is such a wonderful verse here because people like to say that Peter was the first pope. But here we have the spokesman of the twelve. Here we have the undisputed leader of the twelve. And the Apostle Paul says this very wonderful statement. 
it is as clear as could be that the person or the God who gave Peter his apostleship did the same thing to Paul. The apostleship to Peter was to the Jew. The apostleship to Paul was to the Gentile. Verse 8. Verse 9. And recognizing the grace that had been given to me. Look at verse 9, please. Recognizing the grace that had been given to me. The grace that had been given to me is a spiritual gift. And recognizing the spiritual gift that had been given to me, James and Cephas and John, who were reputed to be pillars, gave me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship. Please take note of this. In other words, they said, yes, we recognize that God has given you this ministry. So that we might go to the Gentiles, that is, so that we might do our ministry to the Gentiles, and they to the Jews, verse 9. They only asked us to remember the poor, the very thing I also was eager to do. What poor are those? Those are the poor people of Jerusalem who had uh, suffered persecution, who were famished because of the persecution. And the Apostle Paul says, of course, I'm willing to do that. Why? Because they're the members of the royal family of God, Jew and Gentile in one family. Okay, so in these first 10 verses, we have that particular profile and background. Now let's take a look at what happens sometime later. The Apostle Paul is writing, verse 11, But when Cephas, that's Peter, came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, because he stood condemned. Notice verse 11. The Apostle Paul braces the Apostle Peter. Why? Because he was wrong. He stood condemned means that when you measure up his philosophy with what the Scripture says, that Peter came up short. Verse 12. This is how that developed. Prior to the coming of uh, of certain men from James, that is from the Jerusalem church, Peter used to eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he began to withdraw and hold himself aloof, fearing the party of the circumcision. And you see here that Peter, as broad-chested as he was, when it came to the subject matter of the circumcision, he was fearful. He was fearful that those who had higher status amongst the Jews in Jerusalem would look down upon him and discredit his ministry. Verse 13, the rest of the Jews joined him in hypocrisy. In other words, the Jews who belonged to that congregation saw what Peter was doing, right? And so Peter was impacting the weaker brother in the congregation, and they fell. They were crushed. And so they joined him in hypocrisy, with the result that even Barnabas was carried away by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. Please underline this section again. Verse 14, the truth of the gospel. Paul says, but when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Cephas in the presence of all, if you, being a Jew, live like the Gentiles and not like the Jews, how is it that you compel the Gentiles to live like Jews. In other words, this was a very, very rough time 
in that church because here was this person who was a serial murderer. The Apostle Paul, as Saul, he chased down Christians and was imprisoning them, putting them to death. And now he comes face to face with the undisputed head of the apostles, Peter, and he confronts him to his face. And he says, how can you possibly do this? The underlying message is, Peter, don't you know what the Bible says? Peter, don't you have faith in what the Bible says? So in the, in the verses which follow, the Apostle Paul starts to clarify the issue. He says, we are Jews by nature and not as sinners from among the Gentiles. In other words, we were born Jewish. That's our race. Nevertheless, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but through faith in Christ Jesus, even we have believed in Christ Jesus, so that we may be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law no flesh will be justified. Verse 16 is saying, look, we know that we were born into the Jewish race. We know that we were circumcised on the eighth day. But if we are going to have eternal life, it is through faith in Christ Jesus. Why? Because not by the works of the law, since by the works of the law, no flesh, Jewish or Gentile, will be justified. Verse 17, but if while seeking to be justified in Christ, we ourselves also have been found sinners, is Christ then a minister of sin? May it never be. For if I rebuild what I once destroyed, I prove myself to be a transgressor. In verse 18, he says, you know me. I used to persecute Christians. So if I rebuild my reputation as a Jew, which I destroyed when I became a Christian, then I prove myself to be a liar. Verse 19, For through the law I died to the law so that I might live to God. Oh, what a beautiful verse that is. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying, I believe that when Christ was on the cross, he had me personally in mind. That's why I live today. Verse 21, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died needlessly. Please take a look at how beautiful this chapter is. Okay, let's uh, go back to our lesson. <clears throat> well, we looked at verses 1 through 21. Please take a Take note of this as a summary, and that is that circumcision was a sign of being in covenant with God. It does not necessarily mean that you have salvation. It's just like having your license, registration, and proof of insurance. You may still get a ticket, but you won't get a ticket for not having your license and registration and your insurance. We've looked at Galatians 2, verses 1 through 21. Now let's take a look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, please. And we'll look at verses 1 through 5, and then verses 9 through 25. I know that this is a fairly long passage, but we'll just treat the first five verses this evening. Turn your Bibles, please, to Romans chapter 4. Romans chapter 4. <clears throat> 
And I know that this is kind of uh, disjointed because the doctrine of circumcision is fairly vast and it has uh, many details. But let's jump ahead so that we are able to understand the clear truth of the gospel. Verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham our forefather according to the flesh has found? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Please take note of verse 3. Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him for righteousness. Verse 4. Now, to the one who works, his wage is not credited as a favor, but as what is due. But to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Notice here that there is not one word about circumcision. And you might say, well, aren't, isn't that what we're talking about? Well, that's true. So, verse 9, and we will close with this verse. Verse 9. Is this blessing then on the circumcised or on the, circum or on the uncircumcised also? For we say, faith was credited to Abraham as righteousness. Please note. Faith was credited, not circumcision was credited as righteousness, but faith. How then was it credited, verse 10 asks, while he was circumcised or uncircumcised? Not while circumcised, but while uncircumcised. And so at this point, we are going to close our study this evening, and we will pick this up again the next time that we are together. Once again, please uh, send me your comments and your questions, either by email, text, or put it on the space that's provided for you by YouTube. And, uh, <clears throat> okay, uh, those of you who are uh, part of the church, uh, you will be receiving an email from me referring to our Thanksgiving service, which is coming up at the end of this month. Thank you very much for your kind attention.